Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. The Yankees are one win away from the American League pennant, which means they're one win away from winning a, um, from getting to the World Series. Folks, the Yankees haven't been in the World Series since I was in middle school in the eighth grade. That was the last time they made the World Series. They're one win away from the American League pennant. These last couple of nights have been absolute chaos. I mean, by far, the wildest two baseball games that I've experienced in my life. Now, I was born in 95. Okay, so there may have been there may have been some that I just don't remember. Um, but going back as far as I remember, this is the wildest two-game sequence of Yankees games I've ever watched. The range of emotions <laughs> from the lowest of the lows to let's... You know, texting my buddy, let's uh, let's rebuild in the off season, and then not ten minutes later, texting him back saying we're winning the whole damn thing. That's baseball, man. Like it has been the wildest two games of my life. You know, the, the first six games of this postseason for the Yankees have been fun. They've been very fun. I've felt the energy. Maybe some beg to defer, but I've I've had a good time. But these last two games. It it like it's like oh this is the fucking playoffs, like this is, this is baseball in October, man. This is what it's about, and um, I am now going into tonight. Now I'm recording this Saturday, October nineteenth. It's two forty five, just about. So we're going into tonight, the most excited we've ever been, um, going into a Yankees game, you know. I mean, this is going to feel just like it did going into that game against the Astros in Houston when DJ hit the home run in the ninth. That's like the nerves or the the energy, the excitement that I'm going to have, the stress is going to feel like that. Maybe not as much because the Yankees are up 3-1 to one in this series, man. Which, you know, if you follow me on social media, you wouldn't think that. <laughs> Please don't follow me on social media. I'm warning you now, don't follow me. When I plug my socials in, in a couple of minutes, like, ignore that. That shit, um, when I'm on social media during the game, during the heat of the moment, I am the most irrational human being ever. But I always say, if you listen to my podcasts, I make some sense. So subscribe to the show, not, the, uh, not, not to me on social. Subscribe to my podcast on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, all that, bd 4 where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. But we are talking Yankees, man, and that was a game last night where the Yankees eventually win. <laughs> they eventually win 8-6. to six. Um, You had the righty rookie, Luis Seal, against the righty rookie, Gavin Williams. Top of the first inning, Juan Soto, with a big home run that you just needed to see it. To get the Yankees up 2-0 early. Bottom one, Cleveland answers back with the run. Ramirez hits the sack fly. 
top two. Wells hits a home run. 3-1 Yankees. Good to see that. Off a high fastball. Gavin Williams finishes his night. Two and a third. Three runs. Stephen Vogt continuing to tax his bullpen. Bottom three, Josh Naylor with an RBI. I don't know how he got to the ball. He slaps at it at the end of the bat. Picks up a base hit to left center. Um, it's 3-2 Yankees. Uh, yeah, 3-2. He cuts it to 3-2. Um, that was the same inning where prior to that at-bat, Wells mishandles a throw to second base on a stolen base. Kind of hesitates to make the throw. And then off the Naylor base hit, Verdugo in left field hesitates to make the throw home. Throws it to third, allows the runner to advance to second. So the fundamental shit continues to be a thing. Luis Heel goes four innings, two runs. We'll talk about that later. Top of the six, Giancarlo Stanton. Wow. Is this guy a postseason performer? Wow, is he worth every single penny? Bargain. <laughs> he gets four straight fastballs. Don't know why they're doing that. I don't know why they pitched to him. I would have intentionally walked him. Home run from Stanton. A no doubt shot. Makes it 6-2 Yankees. And you're feeling good. Like, like this, this is like, you should feel like the Yankees have this in the bag, right? Bottom seven, you get the back-to-back doubles from Ramirez and Naylor. And all of a sudden, it's 6-5. to five. Um, you know, Big Christmas. Gets another pinch hit appearance. <laughs> And he hits the ball. The TBS camera made it seem like it was 45 rows deep. Ends up being a fly ball to the left field warning track. Verdugo catches it. During that moment, I I, I melted. Like, I'm watching. And if, you, if anybody was like, if anybody saw my face during that, it just deflated. I thought, I, I saw the Yankees. I, I felt the Yankees season end right there. That was an authentic, the Yankees season just ended their reaction. So that's what I'm going to feel like if the Yankees don't win the World Series. I felt it there because I was certain that was it for the Yankees. Ends up being uh, tis but a scratch. Not even. It was a fly out. Um, bottom of the eighth, you get you know lighters in the game. That's when you get the lighter Rizzo play. Uh, just super frustrating. Uh, Lighter couldn't handle the ground down initially. The ground ball initially takes a breath. Still, you know, has time to get it over. Flicks it to Rizzo. Rizzo should have caught that ball. He bobbles it, and now Fry's on first base with an infield single, and the tying run comes across. It's six six after eight. Top of the ninth, though. Thank gosh, the Yankees answer back. Because if this thing had to go to extras, they, they, they are not winning. One inning further, even. They're not winning it. Uh, Verdugo gets a run across with a ground ball to shortstop. Rokio can't handle it. Run comes in. And then Glaber Torres with a big base hit up the middle. The guy continues to just be super consistent for the Yankees. Absolutely bringing Glaber back next year. It's 8-6 Yankees. Bottom nine, Tommy Canely. Comes in, and he gets the save despite putting two runners on base. And the Yankees win 8-6. to six. So the Yankees, after going Luis Heel, they go Tim Hill, Jake Cousins. Finally, my boy got an appearance. Clay Holmes, Mark Leiter, and Tommy Canley. Those guys go five innings, four runs. The Yankee bats score eight runs on ten hits, three home runs, three walks. And they were two for six with runners in scoring position. I think their best clip yet. This month, Torres goes two for five with an RBI. Soto goes one for four, home run, walk, RBI. Judge, one for four with an intentional walk. Stanton goes one for four with a home run, three RBIs. Rizzo, two for four. Volpe, two for four with a stolen base. Wells, one for four with the home run, an RBI. Verdugo, 0 for three, but a walk and an RBI. And then Jazz goes 0 for four, three strikeouts and a sack bunt. Which, speaking of Jazz Chisholm, we've got to figure out the cleanup spot. We've got to figure out what we're doing at cleanup. It's kind of a game of musical chairs at the moment, ever since they took Wells out. 
which I'm not saying, like, keep Austin Wells where he is. He's clearly more comfortable batting lower in the order than cleanup. It's a big difference for a rookie to bat cleanup for the New York Yankees versus batting eighth, where a catcher is supposed to be. Keep him there. He's clearly more comfortable. Let him hit there. I do want to see a lefty in the cleanup in the cleanup spot. Um, and I would prefer that to be Anthony Rizzo. You know, um, a lot of people do want Giancarlo Stanton batting cleanup after Aaron Judge to provide that protection. I love Stanton where he is at five. I think that's his home and that needs to be his home for as long as the Yankees have him. Um, also, I, I want a lefty there because I want to be able to, one, split up the righties at three and four. And two, I don't want to stack lefties at the bottom of the order seven to nine. Because if you bring Stanton up, that means you're going to be doing that. So, personally, if you're asking me, the couch coach, what I would do, I would probably go... You know, Torres, Soto, Judge, right, left, right. And then I would have, um, at cleanup, I would go Anthony Rizzo, Giancarlo at five, Jazz at six, or Cabrera, to be honest. I don't think Jazz can play anymore. But you got a lefty there. And then Volpe, Wells, Verdugo, seven, eight, nine. So you got right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. You know? Because Jazz Chisholm, Jazz Chisholm has just been so bad. I don't know. I'm trying to find an adjective that makes me feel that that's like aggressive and strong enough because he's been so disgustingly bad. He's been awful. I don't know why Jazz Chisholm these last two games has had been, you know, why, why is he the one that has to split up the righties? In game three, it could have been Verdugo in that spot. Um, and then uh, last night, I think it should have been Rizzo in that spot. Because Jazz Chisholm has provided zero for this team this entire postseason. Zero offensive, offensively. His numbers have been abysmal. He's batting 129 with an OPS of 440 this postseason. That is not playable. He's played every single game. That's not playable anymore. He's going up there and he's taking these long hacks. Big giant loop into his swing right now. There's just so much swing and miss on it. So many swing and misses. And he's getting a lot of pitches inside the zone. And he's just not even close. He's swinging at junk in the dirt. He's just, he's going up there with no approach. And that's why I'll continue to say, like, Jazz Chisholm's not a good hitter. I'm not saying he can't hit. He can hit a little bit. um, But it's the approach. He doesn't have an approach. His two-strike approach is abysmal. It's a guaranteed strikeout the minute you get to two strikes. And I don't care if it's two strikes with him ahead or behind in the count. And that was my concern, by the way. I mentioned this on a couple episodes before the postseason began, I was concerned about Jazz in the playoffs. How would he handle playoff pitching with the approach that he brings to the plate? He doesn't bring one. And, and he's just and he's not providing any protection for Judge. You're seeing them pitch around Aaron Judge last night to get to Jazz. They intentionally walked Aaron Judge. They were giving him all off speed outside the strike zone. So the kid's just not producing. He opens his mouth, and he hasn't done anything to back it up. We love him when he hits. It's fun to be cocky and you're hitting. It's one thing. But you're not backing it up. You just look like a fucking fool. And Jazz Chisholm's a fucking fool. Who, quite frankly, I'm getting tired of watching. He can't hit in the playoffs. He's not been hitting in the playoffs. This is a kid who was born in the Bahamas. He played in Miami his whole career. So maybe he's just not used to cold weather. But that spot needs to go to Cabrera. It needs to go to Cabrera yesterday. Cabrera got on base in the couple games he played in the LDS. 
He had the double in the first game. And then when they played him next, I think game three maybe, he walked three times. Cabrera has to play over Jazz. Jazz can't clean up. I will finish by saying that I think Giancarlo Stanton at cleanup, for those who want that, it's understandable. You know, for, for the sheer potency and the upside that Judge Stanton consecutively can bring, just in terms of fear factor. You know, and also you're keeping, if you do that, if you do that, you can keep Rizzo at the bottom of the order as a secret weapon. I understand it. But we do have a right-handed pitcher on the mound for Cleveland tonight. So I would like to see Rizzo there. I think that'd be perfect. I, I love, I really, like, all these years I've been advocating for the Yankees to get lefties, get lefties. So we finally have that, and we have this beautiful balance in the order where they're able to go left, right, left, right. That's kind of been my thing all year. So I like keeping that intact. It's just very difficult to match up with with your bullpen. You know, it makes it difficult to create lanes for opposing managers. But, you know, Tanner Bybee's on the mound. I would love to see Rizzo at cleanup tonight. If he's clean up, I think that's a big win. Um, Speaking of bullpens, <laughs> you know, Aaron Boone making making noise on social media. Um, Just, you know, the bullpen usage, the decision-making last night, I didn't have too big an issue with it. Um, he goes Tim Hill, Jay Cousins, Holmes, Leiter, Canley. Um, I, I was at the end there. Maybe this was just being a little rational. I was calling for Garrett Cole. I thought they, sh I, I thought they should have had him warming and ready just in case they needed to use Garrett. I thought Cole should have been in there. I would have went to him um, before Leiter. Uh, but, you know, Tim Hill, they go to him for a little. I, I don't know. I thought he could have been used for another inning. He pitches a clean fifth inning, I believe. Um, but there were more lefties to get in the sixth inning. You know, that could have been a lane for him to continue pitching in. Um, however, Lane Thomas was up in the sixth, who's a righty. So they went to Jake Cousins. And Jake Cousins was absolutely filthy in the sixth. He had the wipeout slider working, the two seam running in on the hands. He was great. He did fall off in the seventh inning. And then after Cousins, the Yankees went, or Boone went, to Clay Holmes. Um, you know, did he stick with Clay for too long there? I, I get the move, though. Like, I don't know. The only options at that point were Leiter and Meza, you know. Maybe Canely with, you know, with the lefty Naylor after Holmes allowed that first double. Naylor comes up, so maybe that's where you go to Tommy Canely, but... You know, then you're putting Holmes on a very short leash for a guy who has gotten the job done for you up to that point in the playoffs. I, he had the, I know. But I don't know. Thomas was due up afterwards, who's a righty, and Canely is your lefty specialist guy with that changeup. So I would have used Canely in the bottom of the eighth, not just the ninth inning. After they walked uh, Jose Ramirez intentionally, you have Naylor coming up to the plate. I think that's Canely's lean in my opinion. You know, use him against uh, Naylor. Uh, but, to Leiter's credit, he did get the job done there. He gets Naylor to strike out, swinging on a splitter below the zone. Um, So, you know, people were asking where Marcus Stroman was. First of all, I did not want him in that game. So I was not one of those people. Stroman, at this point in his career simply does not have the stuff for playoff lineups. I want no part of him, um, especially against left-handed hitting. His stuff just doesn't have bite anymore. The movement's not there. The velocity's bad. He's not spinning the ball anymore. Um, he's on the roster, yes, but he's on the roster as a mop-up guy, as a long man, as a guy who is a last resort, go to him in extras type. I'm not blaming Boone for any of the decisions and anything that happened with the bullpen last night. If you're going to blame anybody and get mad at anybody, get frustrated with Brian Cashman. This is Cashman's fault. Because go back to the trade deadline, Cashman didn't acquire a single arm 
And there were arms that were moved for prices that the Yankees could have afforded. You know, Michael Kopeck, Steven Ursig, um, what's the other guy's name? Tanner Scott. A lot of relievers were moved. You were hoping the Yankees would have got one of them, but they got... I mean, Cashman's bullpen acquisitions from the very start of the year, just not not good, man. You know, Ferguson didn't make it far. Gonzalez didn't even make it far. De Los Santos didn't make it far. Mark Leiter was just put on the roster, you know, 24 hours before the game last night. Like, it, it's his fault. He simply didn't get enough depth. And now the bullpen's taxed. The last couple nights, the last two games, the Yankee pen, 10 innings, 9 earned runs. So, for tonight's game, who the hell are you going to go to? You need Rod- Rodon to give you some length, but, like, what if he doesn't? You know, you're probably going to see Mark Leiter again because he didn't look awful. I think Luke Weaver's now going to be available. It'd be nice to avoid him again, you know, because the more you use these relievers in the playoffs, the easier it becomes to hit them. That's been a theme all postseason, every game of different teams. Like, the familiarity is a real thing. Opposing teams, the more they face certain relievers, they get used to their stuff, their break, the timing of their delivery, the extension, etc. It just becomes much easier to pick those guys up. It becomes much easier to pick up. So, you know, Weaver's not been great this series, and I'm sure that's a part of it. Clay Holmes, same thing. He's been banged around. They're used to his sinker-sweeper combo. Weaver with the fastball changeup. Tommy Canely, he got the job done last night, but you could see, like for a guy who's primarily changeup, you could see last night, Cleveland was sit and change. So, you're probably going to see tonight a lot of the guys, they haven't gone to tons. You're probably going to see more lighter. You're probably going to see more Jake Cousins. You might even see Stroman. Just simply because it might help because of the low usage and the unfamiliarity. But it'd be nice to get some length from Rodon. Because he didn't get that from Luis Heel in this game. Who wasn't terrible, but he was rusty, as, you would, as you'd expect him to be in a game like this. He finishes four innings, two runs, three hits, three walks, three strikeouts, and uh, no home runs allowed. His command was not there. It was not sharp. After not pitching in three weeks, it was expected that his command not be there. His changeup was probably his best pitch of the three, but at times, you know, like he threw a nice one in the second inning to Rokio, low in the zone. Uh, flashed a couple nice changeups in the third inning. You know, a low and away first pitch to Manzardo. First strike, he goes below the zone to get a swing and miss on Josh Naylor in the third. But he also left a lot of change-ups up in the zone and just got lucky. Um, He couldn't get the fastball down. It was very up over the zone. It was very wild. The slider didn't have the same horizontal break and bite to it. So, all in all, you know, the stuff wasn't horrible, but the location and the command was bad. Um... But it could have been much worse. You know, we're talking about two runs. You know, the bottom of the first inning, right away, he gets off to a terrifying start. Walks a batter, allows a double. So he's got two in scoring position, nobody out. And he's got a face Ramirez, Naylor, Thomas. And, you know, out of that, only one run scored in the inning to cut the Yankee lead in half. So thank God for Juan Soto, but thank God that Luis Seal was able to limit the damage. Getting a couple flyouts. So, yeah, for for a rookie, number four starting pitcher at the end of the day after a long layoff, this wasn't the worst start in the world for him. But tonight, you're going to need Rodon to give you some some quality innings. It's going to be Tanner Bybee versus Carlos Rodon. Bybee's also on short rest, but, you know, his first start, he was pulled early. He only had 36 pitches thrown. Uh, Carlos Rodon, on the other hand, went deep. He went six innings last time out. He looked excellent. So if he pitches great again, man, I was thinking about this. If he pitches great and picks up the win tonight to get the Yankees to clinch, is he the LCS MVP? I still think Giancarlo's going to get it if the Yankees pick up this win. Um, But 
you know, Rodon is a case. But yeah, he needs to go seven tonight. He needs to go seven tonight. I would expect Cleveland to start a lot of right-handed hitters. I don't know why. I don't know if I'm missing something. If I'm Steven Vogt, like, it's time to start Big Christmas. That guy should be in there. That guy is terrifying. I'm scared of him. I don't care about his track record. I don't care. I don't know much about him. He's just scary. I would go to that guy. He should be starting if I'm Stephen Vogt. Anyways, this is going to be a quick episode. We're going to wrap it up here, get to our break, and then we'll finish it with our trivia question. That'll be that. Stay with us. We'll be back in two minutes. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4. If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. You can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Thanks for listening to BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. All right, welcome back to the show. Episode 727 of the podcast. Woo! One went away, folks. It's still hard to believe. It's still very difficult for me to comprehend and put inside my brain. Their one went away from a World Series appearance. Their first since 2009. They're on the brink. Um. <laughs> well, let's wrap this up with our trivia. Let's do it. Okay. So, speaking of LCS MVP, a couple of minutes ago, which Yankees pitcher was the 2009 ALCS MVP? Andy Pettit, A.J. Burnett, or C.C. Sabathia? Which Yankees pitcher was the 2009 ALCS MVP. Andy Pettit, A.J. Burnett, C.C. Sabathia. Let me know the answer, folks. That's it. This episode's concluded. I appreciate it all. Appreciate you all for tuning into the show. I'm going to wrap this up and uh, hopefully drop this episode before the game starts tonight. So, um, appreciate it. Let's go clench, folks. Let's fucking clench. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, 
Download these episodes and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you. And we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees and go Knicks.